GOAT format is a Yu-Gi-Oh! format that was played between April and September of 2005. It is easily the most popular historical format and is also considered one of the most skillful of all time. In this retrospective, we'll break down what the format is, how to play it, what makes it popular, and much more. And while the state of modern Yu-Gi-Oh! is largely unrecognizable from what it was 10 years ago, this particular era of the game has persisted in the community's memory. My name is Avery, and this is a Yu-Gi-Oh! GOAT format retrospective. Once you have the most powerful monster, you're ready to be a true champion. Get the power. Playtime is over! The power of the cards. It's time to duel! In 2005, competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! was coming out of its first experience with a meta dominated by a single powerful deck known by many as Chaos. This deck was able to rely on the field control offered by three copies of Didi Warrior Lady while building up enough graveyard presence to summon one of the two Chaos monsters available at the time. After surviving two consecutive Forbidden Lists, however, Chaos lost many of its power cards to the April 2005 Forbidden List. Cards like Raigeki, Harpy's Feather Duster, The Forceful Century, and Imperial Order were forbidden all at once, while Didi Warrior Lady and Mystical Space Typhoon went down to Limited. To make up for all these lost power cards, the deck builders of the time turned to other cards that had been largely set aside in prior formats due to the existence of much more powerful alternatives. The cards used to fill in the gap left by the first two Forbidden Lists were, although less powerful than their predecessors, still strong cards overall. In place of Raigeki and Harpy's Feather Duster, cards like Heavy Storm and Lightning Vortex were played. These two cards are great examples of cards that are very powerful in their own right, but still objectively worse than the cards that were previously widely used. Delinquent Duo, interestingly enough, was the only member of the original Spell Ruler Hand Control Trio of Spells to survive into this format. With the Forceful Sentry and Confiscation sitting squarely on the Forbidden List, despite Delinquent Duo arguably being the most powerful of the three, as it eliminated two cards from an opponent's hand. Perhaps the most notable shift in the meta between the 2004 Chaos format and the 2005 GOAT format was the vastly increased use of Flip Effect monsters. Before 2005, the only widely used Flip Effect monster was Magician of Faith, and often at only a single copy. However, with the elimination of the majority of the game's extremely explosive power cards that could turn the advantage of the game in a single play, the advantage of using the slower flip monsters grew. In addition to multiple Magician of Faith that most every deck ran at the time, other flip effect monsters such as Night Assailant and Mask of Darkness started to see usage. To complement these monsters, decks started to run multiple copies of both Book of Moon and Tsukiyomi. Both of these cards shared the ability to flip a monster face down, while Book of Moon had the advantage of being usable on either player's turn while leaving the normal summon free. Tsukiyomi's ability to return to the hand allowed its effect to be used turn after turn. Finally, due to the slowing down of the game, traps were often utilized in greater quantities than they were before. Classic traps such as Mirror Force, Torrential Tribute, and Ring of Destruction remained in use as well as Magic Cylinder starting to see more main deck play. Several new traps also started to get used, including Sakuratsu Armor, which made Battle more dangerous, as well as Raigeki Break and Phoenix Wing Wind Blast, which both helped to maintain field advantage. A distinct shift in the overall strategic goal of the game also shifted in this period. While Chaos format had largely been defined by a wide variety of different board wipes and huge advantage shifting single cards, these cards have become far less available. Instead, games largely became a back and forth of small scale card and field advantage. While power creep had gone backwards in terms of what staple spells and traps were used, one key combo of the format was still extremely popular. The goat combo the deck is named after. The basics of the combo involved two cards, scapegoat and metamorphosis. To perform the combo, all a player had to do was use tri brigade kit, <clears throat> excuse me, excuse me, wrong wrong format. <laughs> to perform the combo, all the player had to do was use Metamorphosis to tribute a level 1 scapegoat token in order to summon the powerful fusion monster Thousand Eyes Restrict. I know it's a very complicated combo compared to what we have today, am I wrong? <laughs> because of how easily this combo gave players access to Thousand Eyes Restrict, the metagame had to form around it. Scapegoats went from being a card that only really allowed a player to stall while they tried to draw into their power cards into a potential power play on its own. While it is no doubt true that the ability to summon Thousand Eyes Restrict is what pushed Scapegoat into being the meta-defining card that it was during this format, it is also important to note how powerful Scapegoat was at this time, even without Metamorphosis. During the April 2005 format, the amount of mass monster destruction cards available was extremely limited. Dark Hole, Raigeki, and Chaos Emperor Dragon had all been banned, and even the power creep version of the stronger cards, like Lightning Vortex, was limited to one copy. As a result, summoning four monsters with one card, even if they had no offensive capabilities 
by themselves was a powerful stalling tactic. Finally, the metamorphosis scapegoat combo was a major factor in why flip effect monsters gained prominence. Aside from being more viable in the slowed down pace of the go format, flip monsters also gained more utility due to the rise in popularity of two cards, Tsukiyomi and Book of Moon. Both of these cards allowed for monsters to be flipped face down, the obvious use of which being the recycling of flip monsters effects. However, these cards saw a particular rise in usage during the GOAT format because of their ability to flip Thousand Eyes Restrict face down. If a player flipped their own Thousand Eyes Restrict face down, they could then reuse the effect and steal another of their opponent's monsters. It also had the use of being able to flip an opponent's Thousand Eyes Restrict face down, allowing for it to be ran over. While Scapegoat and Metamorphosis were essential staples in most decks at the time, there were also a variety of different tech cards that were widely used to counter the strategy. The first of these was Azura Priest. Azura Priest was extremely useful because it could destroy a full board of Scapegoat tokens by itself, an indispensable ability without other easily accessible mass destruction cards. Azura Priest was also useful because of the fact that it too was a spirit monster, meaning it could be kept in a player's hand as a tool for whenever they would next summon Scapegoat tokens. The next major tech card used during the GOAT format was Air Knight Parshath. While Parshath had seen limited usage since its release, it was during GOAT format that he really shined as a card. The popularity of Scapegoat made the presence of defense position monsters with zero defense a very common occurrence, meaning that Parshath could be used for both easy damage as well as generating card advantage for the player controlling it. In case you don't know what Air Knight Parshath does, it does piercing damage to a monster in defense mode. The final major tech monster, as I mentioned earlier, was Tsukiyomi. Tsukiyomi, like Azura Priest, is a spirit monster, but instead of this being a strict disadvantage like it would be in any faster format, the ability of Tsukiyomi to return to the hand every turn proved to be a boom to the card, as this allowed it to potentially be reused at any time. The ability to flip power monsters like Thousand Eyes or Strict or Magician of Faith face down in order to reuse their effects made Tsukiyomi an absolutely indispensable pick for almost every GOAT control deck. Despite the 2005 format being remembered as GOAT format, a large number of tops, especially in the first half of the format, were won by decks that did not focus on the quintessential GOAT combo. However, a deck that did was the 2005 US National Championship winner, Max Suffrage. So let's first break down this main deck that you're looking at here from the choices that he made. Most notable are the choices of cards he ran at more than one copy. First off, he ran three Scapegoat and two Metamorphosis. This should be relatively apparent for its usage in the GOAT combo. In addition to these cards, he ran two copies of Magician of Faith, Gravekeeper Spy, Book of Moon, and Nolman of Crossout. All the cards share the quality that they either are flip effect monsters or have directly to do with flip effect monsters. The deck also shows off the increased use of traps over previous formats. Another interesting component of the deck is the fusion cards used. While most of the choices in the fusion deck had stayed the same since the days of Magical Scientist, there are a few new fusion monsters that had been released that are of note. The first of these is Ojama King, able to be summoned using Metamorphosis on a Jinzo. It prevented an opponent from using Scapegoat by blocking off their monster zones, countering one of the strongest plays at the time. Another new fusion was Dark Blade the Dragon Knight, which could be summoned off of Air Knight Parshath and served as a more powerful form of Kaiku the Ghost Destroyer. The side deck used here is also interesting to note. While side decks of previous formats had largely been random due to the very narrow scope of the meta, there were a variety of different decks that saw competitive play during GOAT format, making the side deck a more important part of deck building than it had previously been. Some card of particular note would include Kiron the Mage, Mobius, Giant Trunade, and Raigeki Break, all of which serve similar purposes in allowing a player to more aggressively address decks that played a large amount of continuous spells and traps. This was particularly relevant when playing against stall or burn decks that use Messenger of Peace and Gravity Bind to great effect. No, Mystic Mind was not a thing during this time, thank God. Mystic Swordsman Level 2 was also an important card against the various flip effect control decks that were popular at the time, while also being able to kill floater monsters like Pyramid Turtle or Giant Rat both popular in Zombies and Warriors, respectively, without allowing them to special summon. Finally, we see he used Poison of the Old Man and Messenger of Peace, allowing for a backup burn strategy to help win the game when entering overtime in a match. The other deck we're going to look at is Brian Long's Goat Control deck from Shonen Jump Boston in September 2005. This list is interesting to note as it comes from the last large tournament of Goat format before the September 2005 Forbidden list came into effect. Because of this, there are some late format releases that were added into the deck. Overall, this deck list is very similar to Max Suffrage's deck outside of some ratio shifts. As this list comes from the final days of GOAT format, the meta had fully evolved to the point that decks started to see certain tech choices to respond to the prevalence of other GOAT control decks in the meta. The most prominent of these choices are the choice to run two Air Knight Parshath in different dimension capsule. Parshath was particularly powerful as a meta call versus scapegoat tokens. 
Different dimension capsule also was an interesting choice that seems to correspond to the slow pace of the format, making a two-turn wait time for a search of any card a viable option. The main new card that we see in this late format Go Control deck is Xerion Universe. Now, Xerion Universe was the epitome of a powerful monster built for the GOAT format. However, it was released in September, and so only saw usage in the meta for an extremely brief period before the shift in the meta away from Scapegoat made the card almost instantly obsolete. There was also the inclusion of Brain Control, which, although not radically different in purpose from Snatch Steel, was still a new staple that didn't see usage until the end of the format. The time of Go Control, while impactful on the metagame, was short-lived. In the September 2005 Forbidden List, the key pieces of the deck were all heavily hit on the ban list. Black Lesser Soldier, Delinquent Duo, and Graceful Charity, the biggest generic power cards left in the game at that time, were all forbidden. Furthermore, Tsukiyomi, Book of Moon, Scapegoat, Thousand Eyes Restrict, and Metamorphosis were all limited to one. This extremely aggressive banning was unique from the previous two lists in that it seemed to be specifically and directly hitting certain decks more than others as opposed to simply just hitting overpowered generic staple cards. There was also another factor that guaranteed the death of Goat Control slow format, the release of Cyber Dragon. While Go Format had slowed the game down to trading card advantage, the introduction of Cyber Dragon in late 2005 gave decks the ability to bring out a powerful monster going second without using their normal summon. This made the potency of weaker flip effect monsters and scapegoat tokens much less as boards of actually powerful monsters could be much more easily established. After these heavy blows to the deck, it would never see mainstream competitive play again, with the deck being fully killed in the September Forbidden List in 2006, where Thousand Eyes Restrict and Tsukiyomi were banned. Although Thousand Eyes Restrict has since come off the Forbidden section of the list as of 2016, Metamorphosis remains forbidden, and even if it were to come off the list, it is unlikely a slow control deck like Go Control would ever truly see a competitive comeback. While near permanent stay on the Forbidden Limited List would prove fatal for almost every other deck to meet that fate, Go Control would come back in a different way. Although there's no concrete date for when it came back, players started to adopt Goat Control as a legacy format around the Xyz formats of 2011 and 2012. As the game started to speed up more rapidly than it ever had before, the slowest format in the game's history up to that point became appealing to many players. A large factor in it gaining traction was the much larger competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! community by this time, both online and in real life. The increased prevalence of online card purchases also made it much easier for players to get a hold of the older cards that were used during the GOAT format. All these factors came together to make easily the most enduring alternate format in Yu-Gi-Oh! history, with many players playing GOAT format both casually and in some specific GOAT format tournaments. But why was GOAT format so popular? Well, it was for several reasons. Perhaps its biggest draw was just simply nostalgia. GOAT format was played before the synchro mechanic existed, which predates Exceeds, Pendulum, and Link Monsters. For many old school duelists, GOAT format is representative of a time when players were players and not pilots. Decks were built through ingenuity as opposed to archetypes. Say, for example, Sword Soul and Tri Brigade. Those are two archetypes that come to mind as of right now. It's also quite a skillful format, particularly the Goat Control Mirror Match, but it emphasizes a different skill set for the modern game. Instead of memorizing long lines of play, aka why I mentioned Tri Brigade Kit earlier, the key to winning in Goat format is to maximize card value by using your cards at opportune times but it is a lot easier said than done. Go format's also a lot cheaper than the modern game to play. Most Go format decks can be built in their entirety for under $50, depending on what you throw in and rarities and things like that. Aside from a few cards such as BLS, Delinquent Duo, Metamorphosis, along with other cards, you can build a Go format deck for pennies on the dollar. When you combine the low price of entry, the high skill ceiling, and the diversity in deck building, Go format has quite a bit to offer any duelist. And the best part, it doesn't change. Decks may change, strategies will evolve, but the card pool is static. There's no anticipating new sets or cards, no waiting on reprints, no waiting on an Albaz Strike Structure deck, no waiting on Battle of Chaos. Once you have your deck built, you can play and you don't have to change a thing. So all of these decks are currently popular in the GOAT format metagame, regardless of which variation you're playing. This is not an all-inclusive list. GOAT format has a surprisingly high amount of viable decks you can play. Part of this is because of how many power cards are available, but there were a lot of strategies available. So the following are simply the most popular of the format. In GOAT format, Go Control is the deck to beat. It is powerful, versatile, and devastating in the right hands. It focuses on controlling the game via flip monsters, powerful spells, and of course Thousand Eyes are strict, Metamorphosis, Tsukiyomi, and Scapegoat. Most players of GOAT format consider it to be the best deck of the format, and also the most difficult to play correctly. However, correct play leads to high win-loss ratios, perhaps higher than any other deck of the format. If you're new to GOAT format, you should play GOAT Control. Not only is it the best deck of the format, it has the highest skill ceiling of any other deck. You can learn to play literally any other deck of the format perfectly, and still lose to someone who plays GOAT Control perfectly.
Chaos comes in many forms, but they all focus on Chaos Sorcerer to generate advantage and mitigate the advantages that Goat Control has. Chaos was not very popular back in 2005. Maybe people didn't realize its potential. Maybe people just were too busy focusing on beating Goat Control. Regardless, the deck has gained both prominence and notoriety since the revival period. Nowadays, it is firmly entrenched as one of the primary challengers for Goat Control. There are a number of ways to build Chaos. You have Control, Turbo, Return, Recruiter, and of course, variations of each. While it sees lower win-loss ratios unless in the hands of a top-level player, it is built to counter Goat Control, so naturally it is going to steal wins. Right now, Chaos seems to be one of the more popular picks along with Goat Control for people who play in Goat Control tournaments. Alternate win has always been a part of Yu-Gi-Oh, and it's no different in GOAT format. There are a number of alternate win decks, including Exodia, Empty Jar, Last Turn, and Burn. Yes, Last Turn was legal in this format. These decks are not nearly as popular as GOAT Controller Chaos, but they can see high win-loss ratios in the hands of a skilled player. Empty Jar in particular has seen play at some higher levels. These decks are fun and are attractive, especially for newer players, but they should not be played regularly or consistently. While everyone has their own definitions of quote, fun, much of the draw of GOAT format is the fact that matches have a high amount of player interaction. Alternate win and OTK decks, for that matter, really, has much lower interaction due to the nature of their win conditions. As a result, don't be surprised if you have some salty opponents if you beat them with some alternate win garbage. OTK decks, like alternate win decks, aren't all that popular, but do see play. The major ones in GOAT format include Ben Kai OTK and Rescue Cat OTK. There's also the ever-popular yet highly volatile Dimension Fusion Turbo and Machine OTK. Cyberstein OTK is also a viable deck, as Stein was legal for GOAT format play. However, it sees more play in post-CRV GOATs due to the release of Cyber Twin Dragon, which makes the OTK a lot easier. OTK decks don't see a lot of play, but they are part of the format and should be understood. So what are some strategies in this format? Well, as we mentioned, Go Format is widely considered one of the most skillful formats of all time, and as such, there are a few basic strategies that you can employ to immediately see improvement in your win-loss ratios. Now, it is true that as the format ages, strategies will come and go. At the same time, much of what I'm about to say will not change. These are sort of the building blocks of GOAT format strategies. Unlike in the modern game, in GOAT format matches, you're not going to be making huge boards turn one. You're not going to drop your hand, and as we say on here on the channel, drop a dookie on the opponent's board. It's a very passive control-oriented format that requires maximizing card value to maintain numerical advantage. Think something like an old-school sub-terror deck. I think would be the best way to describe it, but without links and pendulums and other bullshit shenanigans like that. Like the modern game, pluses and minuses dictate how games go, but unlike the modern game, you're not going to go plus five in a turn. More importantly, going more than plus one in a single turn often turns the tides in your favor. Because of how many turns there are, it's easy to, quote, waste power cards, of which there are many. It's nice being able to play Graceful Charity, but it's not as nice when you have to discard two cards that you really don't want to get rid of. Therefore, knowing when to use your power cards is a crucial skill. The number one goal should always be to maximize card value and card advantage. Using Magician of Faith to bring back a spell card is great, but it's even greater when you're able to recycle that Magician of Faith with Tsukiyomi. Making plays that gain Free plus ones is one of the hallmarks of the format. Understanding your, when your cards will have the highest impact in the game is not an innate skill. It's learned through playing lots and lots of games. This is one of the things about GOAT format, because the card pool doesn't change. You can play and play and get better without worrying about keeping up with the format. Go Control, as a deck, has a lot of combos at its disposal. Understanding when to use those combos, how to set them up, and how to maximize their value is a crucial part of winning consistently. This is known as synergy how well your cards work together to win the game. Go Control has a lot of synergy when played correctly, but can be very disjointed if you're not thinking about what you're doing. Winning in Go format means understanding not only how your deck works, but how all the other decks in the format work as well. In this, it's not unlike the modern game. Unlike the modern game, however, there aren't one or two things you have to stop your opponent from doing. There are literally dozens of things you have to stop them from doing over the course of many turns. Because of how long games last, there's a huge amount of player interaction. This means that you're going to be seeing a lot of cards in any given duel, and it's important to be able to, quote, read opposing cards. Now, what do I mean by this? Reading cards is yet another skill that is learned, and it gets easier the more you play and the more you think about the game. It's easy to try and play around a hand trap in game one of a modern format. Either they have it or they don't. But in Go format, many players will wait on activating trap cards or hold off on destructive combos, so they ensure that they work properly and don't get disrupted. As a basic example, would you rather mirror force your opponent when they have one monster or mirror force your opponent when they have four monsters? In this, you're playing your opponent as much as you're playing your opponent's deck. 
Understanding the why behind everything your opponent does will make it much easier to predict what they will play next and will help you set yourself up to counter it. This goes hand in hand with the previous point regarding knowing the decks of the format and how they work. The more you know about the metagame as a whole, the better prepared you will be to counter it. The risk versus reward dynamic is very much a part of GOAT format. It's one thing to play it safe, keep a lot of cards, and try to whittle your opponent down to zero life points, but it's a lot easier said than done. Playing it safe all the time will almost always leave opportunities on the table. While it's good to always have a card or two of your opponent, if you're passing on potential aggressive options, that conservative playstyle will come to bite you in the ass. You have to know how to minimize risk while maximizing reward. A prime example is BLS. BLS is the king of GOAT format. It is the most powerful card in the GOAT control deck and is often used as a late game finisher more than anything. But sometimes, dropping it early game, when there are still lots of threats that can get rid of it, can be a way to seal the game before the opponent can counter it. It's not always a good plan, but sometimes it is. You want to minimize risk and maximize reward, period. But you also have to know when it's okay to take risks that will yield strong rewards, but at a higher risk. Normally, you don't want to play cards that can't be protected, but sometimes it's the best way to seal a game. The more you play, the easier it gets to spot when those plays are best and when they don't work. Keep in mind that priority is a thing in this format, and the more you're able to understand priority and use it effectively, the better chance you have at getting the W. Now, I did mention the art of reading cards. Mind games are somewhat an extension of that. Because of how slow and interactive GOAT format is, there are a number of things you can do to, quote, psych out your opponent. One of my favorite anecdotes with this is actually back in 2005. Rymus Lizo was playing at an SJC and he desperately wanted his opponent to attack with multiple monsters into his set Mirror Force. He had taken battle damage the turn prior, so he acted like he was preparing to take damage again that turn. Specifically, he reached for the pen he used to calculate life points, and his opponent attacked with multiple monsters right into a Mirror Force. Mind games really are an important part of the format, much more so than in the modern game, and they can be something simple such as a bluff set card or something trickier like Rhymus's play and a whole host of things in between. Many players will use their reads to get a bead on what you have in your hand, so misrepresenting what you have by playing in an unorthodox manner is a type of mind game. The psychology of GOAT format is pretty intricate, and there are a lot of ways you can play mind games with your opponent. Playing and getting better, and seeing them, and using them, are the best way to improve your mind game game, for lack of a better term. At the end of the day, any good strategy has flaws and weaknesses. There is nothing surefire about GOAT format, and it's up to you to find both yours and your opponent's weaknesses and either shore them up or exploit them as necessary. This comes with time, playing, and thinking about your play. If you want to improve, you have to play. You have to talk, and you have to be willing to see your mistakes and improve them. Being delusional about your skill level is the fastest route to mediocrity in GOAT format. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, a like would be appreciated. I did not play competitively in GOAT format. I did not I did not actually go to my first locals until 2008 when Teledad was really huge and Gladiator Beast was really huge. And I love doing the research into this format. I still play this format from time to time, and it's a lot of fun. So if you guys haven't played it, I highly suggest that you do. Thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next video.